Uh, hello again. Welcome back, my friends. Today, if I were to tell you that we were going to talk about plush toys, that would be both factual and wildly underselling the success of the brand we're going to learn about today. And this, uh, this brand, is a, not just a TV show coming out, a Jim Henson produced TV show, it seems. We are joined by Kelly Oriard and Kaylee Christensen, the founders of Slumberkins. Kelly, Kaylee, welcome. Thank you for joining me on the, the unofficial Shopify podcast today. Thank you for having us on. We're excited to share the story. So, all right, Slumberkins, what is it? Slumberkins is an emotional health and wellness brand for families. We have characters that teach different emotional skills, like everything from mindfulness to self-esteem to conflict resolution, stress relief, and even a collection for grief and loss. Um, Kelly and I are both former educators. I'm a former special education teacher, and Kelly is a marriage and family therapist and school counselor. And we've been best friends since we were 14. So it's kind of, there's a long story behind how Slumberkins came to be. Well. Then let's start at the beginning. What inspired you to start Slumberkins? Yeah, we ended up serendipitously uh, on a maternity leave at the same time. So um, lined up with Kaylee's second son and my first son, uh, both working in the schools and Title I schools at the time. And while we were on maternity leave with our new babies, we were really inspired. We were walk going on walks and talking about you know, the difficulties that we were seeing in the schools, which was a rise in behavior, lack of supports for mental health, um, not enough um, homeschool connection where the skills that we were teaching as a therapist and a special ed teacher weren't connecting in the way that we wanted them to back home. And so we thought, well, maybe we can do something on our break, quote unquote, <laughs> from being at, in the schools. And um, we decided to you know, try to, to do something about it. So at the time, we taught ourselves to sew, we created, we thought, let's use creatures and stories to help parents connect with their children and have these tools to support emotional learning um, on a deep level, similar things to what I was probably doing in family therapy sessions, right, to help boost self, self esteem or um, start with mindfulness, things like this. So uh, you know, taught ourselves to sew, wrote the first stories and sold slumberkins at some craft fairs in the local Pacific Northwest and um, kind of just through the power of social media and community, um, were able to get a, you know, very intense following of people who loved the product and um, kind of grew from there. How long ago was that? What year was this when we started? We started, that was in 2016. Well, end of 2015, early 2016. Okay. So eight years ago, uh, mm -hmm. quite, quite a lot of progress in that time. Uh, you know, there was the bad thing in 2020 that occurred, which depending on what you were doing, either helped or hurt. Um, so early on, you've got... You come up with the idea, and it's often in these entrepreneurial stories, it's pain or problem in someone's personal life. And so for, for the two of you, it sounds like it was professional experience that you were seeing um, issues that you felt you could address. How do and you I go? Would add, oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> I would add and pain and problems in our own parenting lives with okay. our own kids and our own journeys, too. It was kind of a culmination of all three. All right. I accept that and the serendipity. How do you, how do we go from that to let's make books and plush toys to help with this? So I think as moms and educators, we both recognized the power of story and we were doing this type of like social stories and interventions in our roles as educators. And then we also had kids that love characters and love favorite TV shows and favorite books. And we kind of just saw the opportunity to really wed the two in a new way that had never been done before. You know, a plush toy is an innovative a children's book isn't innovative. But what we did was created really meaningful moments of connection 
through our publishing, like the way that we write. Kelly is a therapist and fused therapeutic research back therapeutic techniques into each storyline that then really kind of created the magic that people really felt and experienced when they read a Slumberkin story and cuddled up with that creature. Um, and then that magic, really, our first customers are what really fueled the brand forward. All of a sudden, it wasn't us trying to figure out what to do. It was us trying to keep up with demand. And with, I love, well, I love in these journeys when a sewing machine becomes a rapid prototyping tool. And it sounds like that would have happened here. Um, what the first, the, the first plush toy, the first Slumberkin, what was it? It was a, we did a Bigfoot and a sloth. Those were our two first ones. Uh, we're from the Pacific Northwest near Portland, Oregon. Um, so Bigfoot, some people really believe in him out here and it's just a really kind of fun character to play with. Um, and then, and to infuse the storyline, you know, our Bigfoot character stands for self-esteem and um, some of his storylines are inspired by my own experience being very tall. I was six feet tall in sixth grade. You know, kids don't say the nicest things when you're so different. And so, you know, his storyline, Bigfoot Copes with Hurt Feelings, um, comes from those painful personal experiences. And I think, and then our sloth, you know, like, Sloths weren't like trendy at the time. They were, um, but it was a fun and unique creature. And Kelly saw the opportunity to really infuse a progressive muscle relaxation routine into a storyline for a bedtime routine for kids. And so those were our two first and most popular characters. And, you know, the sewing machine was like a big part of year one. We personally sewed, hand sewed about 4,000 slumberkins. And while we were trying to understand, overseas manufacturing and production and finding the right partners, especially when you're in the world of children's toys and especially in the world of toys or things that children sleep with. <laughs> Safety and production was like a really, a really good piece of the puzzle for us. Absolutely. Well, how did you go about researching that or figuring, figuring it out? Like even when you're making it yourself, it still has to be, you know, flame retardant. It has to be non-toxic. Ideally, we don't have lead in our plush toys, right? Like how do you address it? Yeah, I mean, early days, we were going down to our local craft stores where we were buying, you know, the fabric at Joanne Fabrics or just wherever was around town and kind of putting together. It was really handmade kind of craft project almost um, or when in the early days. But then um, as we were unable to keep up with demand and wanted to keep trying, um, I started to do research about, OK, you know, I, I had no experience in this. So I, you know, Googled. How who makes these plush Disney's. toys? Who makes IKEA plush toys? Like who are the best going to? Because they're going to have to follow those rules and standards, which we wanted to have as well. So actually, it was like eleven pages deep on Google that I happened to run into the name of a the president of a company that was based overseas, but he was in LA, and so I just took a chance wrote him an email and said, Hey, you know, I'm a teacher turned entrepreneur. I'm trying to figure out how to make plush. I'm making this here. I can't keep up. I've like bought out all of the <laughs> plush in my local stores here. And I think I have something, but you know, I'd like to make, I think I said at the time, like, you know, a thousand with, with you, could you help me? And, you know, he, he, they did work with Disney and <laughs> Ikea and everything. He's like, that's really sweet. We make, you know, one skew. So one is 5,000. You have to make 5,000 of them for one skew. And we were like, so we're a little bit too small for you right now. But actually through connecting with him and I asked if he would be a mentor or just help me as I navigated trying to figure out how to do it on a smaller scale in an ethical way. And I think just through relationship building, by the time we got to the point where we were almost about to produce with somebody else who was smaller, they weren't able to give us their um, certificate of clients around like child labor laws. And he, he was like, don't do it. This is like a scam. You cannot, don't, I cannot watch you go down that path. And so he ended up lowering his MLQs for us and taking us on and taking a chance on us. Um, in that factory. And that 
person, actually. Then we met people behind the scenes, like the founder of Build a Bear, Maxine Clark, because she also was using them in production and became good friends with her. And it, it just opened so many doors to have the right production person. And again, that was like serendipity <laughs> at its finest. Page yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. There's so many, but so often on the show, we hear, you know, he said, hey, you're going to get scammed, like run, don't do it. And it, I've done enough of these interviews. It happens a lot. Like that's the first, often, you know, the, the first terrible thing that occurs is issues finding and getting a manufacturer to deliver. And so I'm, I'm happy to hear you were able to avoid that. Um, were there, in the early days, were there any other, like what was one other primary challenge you faced other than locating a manufacturer? I would say um, when we appeared on Shark Tank, that was right around the time that we were still making them in the U.S. And actually our first shipment of, I believe it was 14,000 that we ended up getting in our first shipment over was landing on the day we aired on Shark Tank. But they were unpackaged. We had to figure out how to package them stateside. And then we aired in November and like November 12th or 9th or something like that and then it was the e-commerce like holiday shipping window where we needed to quickly turn them to deliver them to families in time for the holidays and so that was one of our like biggest most stressful like pain point like we didn't have a facility that could receive pallets <laughs> like we were still like working out of our homes and I think we had a small office at the time that was like you know 800 square feet or something and we were still like shipping them from our office as well. We were our own fulfillment partners. And so um, that was chaos. And we had all of our friends and family join in on the fun on hand packaging 14,000 slumber cans and shipping them out. I know Kelly and I <laughs> personally missed Thanksgiving that year because we were doing customer service for Black Friday. Like it was just complete chaos. <laughs> and But at the same time, it was such like, an amazing opportunity for us as a brand just to kind of you know, think bigger for the brand when you're put on that on that scale of a of a platform and program over what your strategy really is moving forward. So, well, absolutely. Tell me about that Shark Tank experience. Did you get Did you get funded through Shark Tank? No, we didn't even get an offer. We went in thinking, "Gosh, of course we're going to get an offer. We're going to win." And our only experience in business at the time was literally watching Shark Tank. So we watched every episode before we went there. We went in confident. We quit our jobs before we got there because we were like, "They're going to ask us if we're committed. We have to be true and honest that we totally are committed." And then yeah, we went in and um I remember one of the things they asked us. So one of the things when we watched the show was we saw a lot of people get attacked for being wishy-washy when they were talking with the sharks, right? Like they said one thing and then the shark said something and then they kind of waffled and then people would go out. So we were like, we, whatever we say, even if we don't know that that's fully true, we're going to just be really confident about it. We're going to be like, yep, that's what we're doing. And we know exactly what we're doing, even though we had no idea what we were doing. <laughs> um, so they asked us, well, you're doing direct to consumer now. Uh, what's your plan for growth? And we were so early in that time, but we were like, we want to go mass. We're going to go mass. We want to get to more families. We want to get to spread this mission. And I remember Mark Cuban saying, well, you know, you're going to have to decide, is it the money or the mission? And I remember being like, it's the mission. And so it was like, made us look <laughs> really like these nice teachers. But then the next day after Shark Take I, that we filmed, Toys R Us went under, all retail was like going down. Like we weren't super aware of that, but all all of the sharks were. So they were like, yeah, no, we're out. <laughs> we're not going to support you with your crazy idea to go to, you have something going good for DTC and you're going to switch to mass. Like that doesn't make sense. So everybody <laughs> went out. The So did that, well, all right. So your experience is not unusual. I mean, most people don't get the offer. And even when they do, like the due diligence comes after the show. And you know this, but um the due diligence comes after the show and then often it falls through there. I don't know that I've, I've interviewed somebody or talked to somebody that like actually got, you know, the investment through the show. But I mean, the real magic is the experience, the exposure, the legitimacy and the bump every time the rerun airs. Do you see it like in your traffic? You're like, oh, rerun was aired. 
Yeah, we do. I'll randomly like look and see spikes and I can attribute it to re-airing. Or if I know that we're re-airing, I'll look and we do get, we'll still get, and people consume media so differently these days, you know, like people are still watching our season for the first time just because they're watching it on Hulu. And so like we get DMs all the time that it's like, oh, I just saw you guys on Shark Tank. I'm so glad you guys are still around. Like they really missed out. Like we still, I think, win over the consumers. (laughs) even nine years almost like eight years later now have you so i always do this when someone says they're on shark tank i google like brand name shark tank and i check to see do you have a shark tank landing page on your site and i i don't think you do it it, it totally missed opportunity make a page for those viewers where you're like oh you know talk about your experience if sometimes if you're lucky you could embed like a clip from the episode and then you know, then it's like, oh, and you know, if you want to learn more, here's our, our products, our collection, you know, hopefully to get yeah. them to then browse it. That's a great idea. I haven't thought about like how to continue to leverage it other than just the in- inbound traffic that we see from it. But that's great. Yeah, just a little, you know, quick, quick SEO win for like these, the, you know, small community of Shark Tank attendees. So yeah. when you think about your, I think about this with, people who sell products for parents, families, kids. When you think about your target market, in your head, who is it? Who's the ideal customer? Because it's like, you know, it's a unit. It's potentially multiple people. Yeah. Well, so this is where I think founder market fit really kind of helps us. I mean, we are, we typically market to overwhelmed parents, which we are. (laughs) I have three kids. Kelly has two. Like, we're very much like in it. And so, it's a natural voice and brand message where we can really kind of position our brand as, I mean, we are users, users of our own products as well. And, but right now I think our, if we had to like name our like target personas that we've identified as a brand, it's like a big segment of overwhelmed moms. Um, Another segment of kind of like first time like super learner parents like people that just want to do everything like perfectly for their first child and then we know that if they have a second they become the overwhelmed mom very quickly um but yeah i mean our primary demo is like millennial and gen z parents and you know i should have asked earlier slumberkins is such a it's a fantastic name did was that always the name did you start with that how did you come up with it Actually, we started um, because we were doing craft fairs. It was sort of me and Kaylee, you know, just different products. And what, at our first craft fair, we had sewn what we were calling slumberland creatures at the time. So those were our slumber pens. Uh, so slumber was always part of the name because it was like a bedtime routine um, that we came up with, with the, the plush. But we also had you know, nursing scarves and decor. We were just like going on this crafting project for these uh, fairs. And so our name at the time was uh, Spoon and Moon. So Kaylee's last name was Spooner. So that was like Spoon and my uh, partner called me Luna. So it was like Spoon and Moon. We thought, oh, that's a cute little baby brand. Um, And these are Slumberland creatures. But then we saw that the Slumber the creatures were the things that were selling. So we're like, okay, wow, we have something here. We can drop the nursing scarf. <laughs> um, and we went to look up like, oh, could we get that name? And um, that is actually owned by Disney. So we were like, whoa, okay, uh, that's not going to work. So we started just brainstorming around what, what are we doing? Like what, you know, what, what are we trying to go for here? And slumber kit, we landed on slumberkins with, a whole bunch of other funny ideas now that we look back because I think we really landed on the perfect name. Although sometimes it doesn't express the fullness of what we're, <laughs> what's underneath the surface with all of our creatures and the mental health and emotional wellness side. Um, people just really hear slumberkins and feel that comfort and connection and cuddling, which is great too. It it is a good it is a good brand name, and it's one of those where it's like it it feels right. And, but when you hear it, you're like, I, I got to know more. Like there's it, an air of curiosity to it. I love that early on you start with in-person events. I hear this a lot talking to entrepreneurs as they, they do in-person events because it makes a, a very impactful connection. 
depending on where you live, um, in-person marketplaces can be quite accessible. Um, certainly me in the, in the Chicago suburbs, there are several I like to go to. You get to connect to people face to face and help develop word of mouth and get feedback early on. You, did you feel that Were you like, you know, in a potentially unintentional iterative product development cycle, just going to those fairs and you know, meeting the same people over and over? Absolutely. I mean, the feedback was the thing that I think fueled us forward people. And to this day, when our brand is at any sort of trade show, we we get lots of criers in the booths because the moment someone reads the storylines, it connects with them in such a deep way, because what what's embedded in the storylines is really a lot of like inner child, like healing narrative and work that adults never heard as a child. And then it gives the parents that tool and that script from a family therapist to then read and um, kind of parent their children in a different way than all of us that were raised in the 80s or 90s, like didn't receive just because, and it's not that our parents didn't, you know, they didn't do anything wrong. It just, it, the conversation around mental and emotional health wasn't, there's so much less stigma around it now. Now it's like, yes, proactively we build these skills instead of waiting until something's really wrong to address it. It makes me feel like I should be purchasing some of these books for myself. Uh, the So f you're starting in markets. At what point do you start the Shopify store? When do you start selling online? We actually started on Etsy first because it just made it easy. I mean, we were educators turned entrepreneurs. We just needed the easiest way to market. Yeah. Um, and then we waited once we knew we were going to change the name to Slumberkins, we, you know, cause we did our diligence of filing trademark before we launched with it. And, you know, that's something that really early on, because we were working part-time in the schools for the first like 18 months, we didn't pay ourselves anything from any revenue we made. We, um, invested it all into either purchasing more fabric and, or IP protection. So we, you know, to the point on sewing machines and prototypes like we got design patent awards on our like character designs and also like tra early trademark um, protection which down the road has been benefited us so much in the world of um ip licensing like in our deal with the jim henson company that you know you mentioned the show it streams on apple like all of that had we not laid that foundation either wouldn't have happened or it would have been a different scenario for us. Do you, there'd be a Jim Henson show that's like suspiciously similar, but not the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy. Exactly. Even back in like 2019, uh, there was a, a blatant knockoff that, that ended up appearing at like TJ Maxx. And when we sent a cease and desist and showed that we had proof of a design patent, they were they took them down, stopped selling, and said they were actually surprised that we had that type of protection. But yeah, we they, were able as to they were counting on you to have it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we no, got they it. Were. So take it down. <laughs> yeah. So it's benefited us for sure as a brand and just like protecting the characters, which you know goes back to we started out as teachers and moms wanting to provide tools that just made like bedtime more meaningful, more intentional, um, helped proactively have these conversations around emotions and meeting kids' emotional needs to really help prevent some of the things that we were seeing in the schools with school-aged kids. And what we didn't really realize in the early days was that like what we were really creating was some really valuable um, IP in the form of character IP that now now that the brand is built and we have the 15 core characters, each character has almost its own platform around the different themes that they stand for and can be leveraged in the world of licensing and IP and content um, in so many different ways that it truly like we're almost nine years in and some days it feels like we're just getting started. <laughs> and this so that this pivotal business decision to get those trademarks to make sure this is formally, you know, you formally own the IP for these characters that, you know, and, and early on it, you know, you can't picture what's going to happen. And so it just feels like this is, this is a thing I, I know I'm supposed to do as a potential business owner here. And then you know, down the road, you want to go back in time and thank yourself. It seems. Uh, I think that's also just founders, other entrepreneurs and founders that we meet. You, It's a certain type of person. They're a little bit crazy. You 
regular people look at what you're doing and they're like, why? This is really weird. If you're not on the edge of people judging you and feeling like what you're doing is a little crazy or weird, you're probably not doing enough. <laughs> because really, I, I remember getting that first patent, the, the lawyer was like, I mean, sure, we can get a design patent on this if you want to pay me, you know? And I remember my mom saying, no, guys, this is really weird. Well, are you sure you want to do this? This is this lovely, flat animal. Like, what is this? And um, I think we were so passionate about it and seeing people respond and having the experiences that they were, there was just no stopping us. We just were like, no, nope, this is how it goes. We have to get it protected. We're going to someday we'll have a TV show. <laughs> and we did say that on Shark Tank and they laughed at us. So that was another one where they're like, yeah, that's what everybody says. And we were like, oh, and yet you oh, were, we're on TV it. with them. Right. And yeah. you did get that TV show. Yeah. Uh, how how did that happen? How did you get the show? We were at a conference called the Altitude Summit, the Alt Summit that is for kind of creative entrepreneurs and design. And, and it's really like geared towards women. And we ended up at a sponsored dinner and we were we ended up sitting at the same table as the president of television for the Jim Henson Company. And um, we had done our diligence to know that they were going to be there <laughs> or that she was going to be there. And so we were just hoping and wishing and praying that we had like an opportunity to speak to, to, speak to her. And that dinner was it. Um, but to back up for a second, I'm leaving out the piece that's crucial to this story. Um, when we appeared on Shark Tank, we did see a bump in revenue enough. So where Kelly and I said, okay, let's take like $15,000 of that increase of bump in revenue of cash that we just got. And let's invest it in uh, YouTube. Like let's invest it in making a puppet and content. And like, let's try to bring one of our characters to life and see if we can do something ourselves on YouTube. So we had a friend build a puppet, but we gave him the money to do it. You know, like we, he built a, um, set in his garage and we like filmed three like puppet bigfoot puppet youtube um videos and we learned a lot of lessons we learned how expensive it is to make content um and then we also had the prototypes of our puppet we had the like concept we had the vision that like these things can come to life so that in that moment when we met hallie the president of television at the altitude conference we were like my gosh look at what we're making and she was like what it's a puppet like we need to talk more and i love the mission i she, at the time she was a single mom and she had a child that had anxiety and so she really just connected with the mission and what we were doing and it really became relationship based where you know we went out to dinner with her at the conference the next evening and like at that dinner table she was like let's do this Let's make a show. And Kelly and I are like sitting at the table, kicking each other underneath the table, just not even knowing if this is real. And it wasn't until we got back to the Portland area, back home. And like the next week we were like, okay, let's get on a call. Let's see what we need to do to like actually make this happen. And I just remember exactly where we were standing in my house at the time when she goes, no, girls, like this is happening. Like I'm the person you need to talk to. Like you don't have to pitch to anyone. Like we're just going to do this together. And so we kind of got, we got, we have a very unique process, you know, like that's not how it goes for a lot of people to get a show made. And so it, for us, it just comes back to relationship, serendipity, the timing, also the grit and tenacity around like the the work that we had put in to even get to the prototype <laughs> and vision of it. So there is, there's a, it is easy to dismiss your success as they got lucky, but when you just keep getting lucky over and over and over, it's not luck anymore, right? It's you have created a scenario and there's a term for this. I heard a Ted talk called a luck sale. And I've been obsessed with this concept for years since um, that, the culmination of, of these decisions, of your actions, of the things you're doing, and, you know, the the energy that you're putting out into the world and making people aware of what you're doing and what you are hoping to get is what creates these opportunities. Man, did it ever pay off for you? This is just incredible. 
Yeah, thank you. We have a group of entrepreneurial friends that will joke around in the early days. They would joke around and say we were like the Mr. Beans of business because we would just like <laughs> come back to the meeting and be like, and guess what's happening now? Because they're like, they were, like nah, I just don't even, yeah. yeah. They're like, I don't even want to hear it anymore. And you just stumbled in and now you have a TV show that we're selling these and now you found the best manufacturer. Uh, but I also just think too, it's like what we were saying. We, definitely were we've always been authentic and open and just ourselves and willing to kind of look like crazy people because we were in it together so we would always say okay well even though this is scary and strange or weird or people don't get what we're doing like we get what we're doing and so we like pump each other up (laughs) and I think that's helped us like keep driving forward when I think other entrepreneurs or solo entrepreneurs, sometimes you lose your confidence or you feel like, man, maybe I need to go get my MBA or have a go to business school because this isn't working, you know, like that there's someone who's going to answer or be able to help you do it. But I, I think that it's just that tenacity and like willingness to get put yourself out there and fail <laughs> a lot. <laughs> yeah, it is. You're right. I mean, there's you're you're going to get punched in the face. It's just Mm -hmm. accepting that you'll have to dust yourself off and then do it again. Um, And as long as you can keep doing that, you you get somewhere eventually. Uh, Yeah. It's just incredible. I thought that that would end at some point. Like maybe once we like got to this, some sort of status in place with the business that we would stop like turning around corners and getting punched in the face. Uh, Let me give you a little hint. It never stops. Yeah. (laughs) New different problems. So I, I, I really don't have a ton of experience playing families, children, and parents. Um, Is this a competitive market? Yeah, it's very competitive. I mean, the toy industry by nature is one of the most competitive spaces (laughs) out there, you know, like, but that's more the traditional toy, toy industry where they're fighting for kind of aisle space. And I personally love the documentary on Netflix called The Toys That Made Us because it goes into the history of the competitiveness of the industry. And that's where I think being direct to consumer really kind of set us apart in the early days because we didn't rely on retail to sell our products. And um, we also were able to build connection with the consumer with that direct one-to-one relationship and really build an online community. You know, you mentioned, you know, the big thing that happened to everybody in 2020, you know, when, when COVID hit, it actually accelerated us because parents were really looking to find community online. And um, it's when our Facebook group of mostly moms um, kind of grew the most. And, you know, it still has almost 50,000 members in it. And they're just our our diehard Slumberkins community where, you know, we know of 10 adults that have Slumberkins tattoos because the messages and the characters are so meaningful to them. Um, And everyone was shopping online and looking for ways to support kids and tools and resources because you were all trapped at home and you really needed support. The 100%. Um, yeah, and people getting tattoos with your stuff. That's yeah. like in, in business school, in case studies, when you talk about branding, inevitably Harley Davidson will come up and it's like, well, you know, what other brands do people get the tattoo of the logo consistently? And so like in my head... My MBA background says, like, if they're getting tattoos of it, you have nailed your branding. So we always put that in the decks when we talk to investors and we're like, here's our tattoo page. And they'd be like, "Okay, this is real. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of legitimacy in that. So I am curious about the the way you approach social media and community engagement. You've got uh, a Facebook group with with 50,000 people. Uh, just talk to me a little bit about how you interact with that community or think about it or like, you know, initiatives or programs within it. Yeah. So uh, Kelly and I stay very connected with that group. You know, they're really the diehard community that shows up for, you know, when we do lives weekly in there, um, just really wanting to stay connected and also just show that, that we're just human. (laughs) We're also in the trenches of parenting and figuring it out. You know, we might be experts in our fields of a teacher and a therapist, but we're also still human and moms. And I think that, you know, in the world of children's toys and education, 
you can't find brands where you can get access to the founders like we've kept it. And because it's just so meaningful. Another thing that happened where the community really showed up for us was when the Silicon Valley Bank crash happened. Our funds were tied up in Silicon Valley Bank. Oh, yeah, it was. I mean, we had the re- so Kelly and I were flying back from New York that day back to Portland. And I was, you know, we had requested that the funds be transferred out to a different bank, but they did not make it out in time until until when it crashed. So when we landed in Portland, we didn't know how we were going to pay payroll the next week. And we had zero dollars in the bank. And we we literally had we didn't know what we were going to do. And the board had done an emergency meeting while we were in while we were flying and someone on the board had just said in recognition of as a board member or it's our fiduciary responsibility to think about wind down plans if this is bad like if if nothing if we can't recover funds and any of that and so but Kelly and I as the founders you know you hear wind down plans of like your baby that you've built and kind of go uh-uh. into like no like mama Brooklyn bear Valley is not gonna kill us right now we did not come this far to be <laughs> uh, yeah to be killed by the bank <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so uh, we ended up like launching a sale because what we did have was inventory that we could sell to generate cash so we ended up being very vulnerable and transparent with the community online And launching a a sale and said, you know, here's a code you can purchase with the code or you can purchase full price. Anything that comes in will help save slumberkins because like we literally don't know what we're going to do. And in that one weekend where the cash was in limbo all over the place, we generated as much cash as we lost that we lost in the bank. So then we at least knew, I mean, the community literally rallied and showed up and like saved the brand that weekend. And then when we, you know, everyone eventually got their cash returned to them, um, you know, it really put us in a, in a better position as a brand in this like economic climate to begin with. And the, the community was just so happy to show up and say like, Hey, this brand matters a lot to us. And then, and organically share it with their friends and family, which is kind of what fueled the, the fire, because it's pretty crazy to me to think that, even over that weekend, 60% of our customers were new customers, hmm. which means the community evangelized Harbourcore. That's incredible. Yeah, that yeah. really does speak to the, the power of it, doesn't it? Yeah. And it was really only because we were vulnerable ourselves, like not afraid to show our weakness that then like people felt really compelled to like show up for us. And, you know, to this day, that was seriously one of the most impactful, meaningful things to have experienced when you like really have no idea what you're going to (laughs) do. Well, and I think too, just the difference of how we approach that shows, you know, that we're not business people too, because I think some of the business people behind the scenes who are part of our board or advisors, that there were people who were like, you should not have done that. You cannot show weakness like this to your customer. It's going to make you lose partnerships, like really came down hard mm. on us. And I remember responding to that email and saying, look, we are here to promote authentic relationships, how to be in community and support each other. We're showing up and supporting them. And we're not just going to like grin and bear it when we're actually dying. Like we're going to reach out to our community because that's how we work. It's reciprocal. It's open. We're in connection with them. So this is such a brand aligned move and it's just authentic to who we are. It's not a strategic thing, you know? And I think I, that just that shift of like having businesses or women and just people coming and approaching things differently right now is. I think such a nice shift to just maybe the old way of like, look good at all costs. So you don't lose any uh, clout. <laughs> no, I a hundred percent. You're right. And having that, that authenticity and that vulnerability, I think works really well, but it is core to your brand and your mission. I think, um, yeah. you know, that gauging in emotional intelligence and, and authenticity and candor, um, just fabulous. And okay. Did you take a screenshot of the weekend sales and send it back to that person? Oh, yeah. They were fully aware. And I mean, it was one of those things where I think there was just, you know, conflicting perspectives. But at the end of the day, like, you know, no one can be mad when you're (laughs) 
community generates as much cash as you lost in the bank to put the company back in a safe position. And, you know, investors don't have to, you know, fork over cash they weren't planning to invest in a company in the first place. So it was just, it was all, it was all around a win-win. And actually, I think it brought us some partnerships and um, I will say that we're still trying to untangle some of the data pieces, I think, because of the unique aspect over sharing um, to customers that might not typically be our target consumer. We have dealt with some like weird retarget retargeting like algorithm things behind the scenes over trying to reach the right customers, like based on like if we're retargeting like lookalike audiences that like something happened with that weekend with like from a retention standpoint that we're still, we still have lots of theories about and that we're constantly kind of untangling, but it's all a learning lesson, you know? The, the you know yeah. And I want to, want to switch gears a little bit. And as we, we come to the end of our time together and I, I want your, your reflective advice on a few things. So if I'm an entrepreneur and I, I want to get into manufacturing, selling it, something into the, the children's products market, and it's so saturated, what advice would you give me? I would, we'll probably both have answers to these questions. I would definitely do your research before launching. Like we had an idea over what we wanted to do. And we did a lot of research on design, content, what already exists and what would make us unique. And even before starting to sew well, it was just a lot of online research um which kind of helped us even do our prototypes over how are they going to look different how are we going to even be able to differentiate them enough to go get an ip <laughs> to go protect them as ip i would say um the thing that ended up helping us the most was from the get-go once we knew what we were doing believing in our product, believing in what we were doing and making real connections with people, whether that was customers or people that we were going to partner with, it came down to relationships that ended up unlocking doors and helping us move to the next step, like one step in front of the other. Like the craft row that we went to, I remember it felt like we were going to the NCAA tournament, packing up the van and like, you know, and we sold like 10 of them and we were ecstatic. We were so excited, you know, so it's like not letting your planning or thinking get over your skis about where you want it to go. Like have your North Star of what it could be and be excited about that, but also be excited about every step, every person that you impact, every customer that you talk to and what's their experience and what's their feedback. And we were really just authentically, that was how we were operating. And I think that's what allowed us to gain community to gain the traction that we did that then now we're able to really leverage the community it's like the people who can show up and talk on our behalf and say how much they love it like that's what makes partnerships happen that's what makes the doors open to you know expanding what we have now and the brand you have is very creative driven so entrepreneurship hard enough then coupling it to creativity, like maintaining that creative vision, creative output is tough. Is there anything you do to stay focused as a creative entrepreneur to stay energized? At this point in the journey, it's a lot of self-care and balance <laughs> that we need to do because both of us along the way have hit at different points, like 100% burnout of just kind of running ourselves into the ground because in the early days when you have the opportunity to go on shark tank you do you drop everything to like make sure you hit those deadlines to get on that show then when you have a potential deal with the jim henson company you do everything you can to like make sure that deal goes through you know like and you know we sacrificed and we also had new kids new babe new babies at home where we were you know in postpartum eras not taking care of ourselves in the way that we should be so now down down the road, it's a lot more about like, how do we actually like balance our cortisol levels in our system and be able to like show up and add the creative value that we do bring to the company. I would say Kelly and I split a lot of the kind of like creative vision where Kelly's more over like anything children's from like product or publishing, anything that's going to get in front of a 
child through a parent, Kelly, overseas. Um, and then anything that's like creative and branding um, and like communication like to the parents is kind of what I oversee. And that's kind of how we've we've split the different creative realms, too. I think that's smart it's having so work life balance for sure, self care um, and clear, clear delegation of like who's responsible for what seems to be what has helped here and being self-aware about it. Yeah. Um, and also stepping out of the normal day to day, you know, the, in this day and age, a lot of people are on zoom calls all day long. And I don't, I don't know about anyone else, but it stifles my creativity. I think Kelly and I sometimes do our best work when we actually get outside and we're driving around going on an adventure. We're just in conversation and we really can have like an authentic conversation that leads to kind of a brainstorm instead of feeling like, okay, in this next hour, we're going to brainstorm this, this, and this, and we're all going to stare each other on zoom. Like sometimes that just doesn't work. <laughs> so in the last you know eight, nine years, you really come an incredible distance and it's been been quite the journey five years from now where do you think slumberkins is going to be what what's your vision i would say in five years my hope is that um we're on track or on scale with being the next you know sesame street for this generation where we have the recognition across the globe um we we have started that across um, the world with our partnership with Apple TV Plus, with our show, it's translated into 22 languages. But I think just that awareness and ability for us to help support changing the way we approach emotional health and wellness, and really looking at it from a systems perspective so that we're, we're supporting kids, we're supporting families. And when we are able to support mental health, mental and emotional health, the way that we did literacy or reading, you know, with Sesame Street back in the day, I, I really think that's going to change um, a lot of outcomes for the future generations. So my my hope is that we're solidified in that position in the next five years. I I have faith, and I absolutely I I believe you, and I believe in you because I know Yeti versus Elmo. Elmo's done. It's over. Right, that cage match. I think Yeti's winning against. I mean, is there any any of the the Sesame Street monsters that we're going to be able to take on a Yeti? I don't think so. I mean, Big Bird's <laughs> pretty huge. <laughs> snuffle up, I guess, maybe just by inertia. Yeah, snuffle up again. And I mean, Oscar can be pretty intense. I don't know. Our characters are so sweet. I don't know if they could handle his trash talk. <laughs> Maybe Hammerhead, Hammerhead, and yeah. Oscar would be a really fun like parody. Uh, and on that note. Where can we go to learn more about you? Slumberkins.com and Slumberkins is the handle ac across all social channels. And um, our Facebook group is called the Slumberkins Social on Facebook. This, what an incredible story. Thank you for sharing it with me, Kelly and yeah, Kaylee. Thank you. Uh, Kelly Oriard, Kaylee Christensen, Slumberkins. Check it out, slumberkins.com.